Do you think I? <laughs> Barry should go first. Here's all my stuff. Yeah, Barry, you're first. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Hey everyone, thank you for coming. Um, so over this session, we're going to talk about investing in LGBTQ founded startups. And just to kick us off, I'd just love to get an idea in this room, how many people would like to set up a business at some point in their career? Like, throw your hands up. Oh, I love this. Yeah, okay, we've got the right, we've got the right audience. This is good. <laughs> um, put your hands up if you have founded a business at some point. Anyone successfully raised financing? Couple, perfect. Anyone raising right now? <laughs> um, Did you sit by me for a reason? <laughs> the reason I asked everyone to do that, the big gap between the aspiration to set up a business and the actuality of making it happen is often funding. And issues of identity make that process of fundraising a little bit more complex. And that's what we're gonna explore in today's panel. Just set the scene a little, I thought it might be useful to take a look at some data on this topic. Startout, some of you might be familiar with Startout. They're a US nonprofit. They champion entrepreneurship in, among the queer community. They recently did some research that established 0.5% of all investment into entrepreneurs goes to entrepreneurs who define themselves as LGBTQ+. Not 0.5%. That's 0.5% out of $2.1 trillion. That's obviously not representative of the community. Incidentally, 8% goes to female founders. So there are some big structural problems here. Bringing that home to the UK, Pride Ventures have recently done some work which will be published over the next couple of months that found that in spite of 92% of the VC community talking about diversity, only 23% of them have active programs in place to encourage increased investment into LGBTQ plus founders. In most cases, the reason driving this is just they don't know anyone. They found that the more VCs have a LGBTQ identified founder within their portfolio, the more likely they are to take active measures to improve access and improve representation um, and it's really interesting work. It'll be published very, very soon. Anyway, that's enough from me. Um, I'd love to introduce the panel, and let's kick off with Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel Taylor. Um, pleasure to be here. I'm a partner at Aries Management, which is a global alternative asset manager. Um, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Our comps are groups like Carlyle, Blackstone, KKR, um, Apollo. We invest um, across the globe um, in alternative assets. So things like real estate, real assets, private equity, credits, secondaries. Um, and so hopefully I can bring the institutional perspective um, and, you know, to, to capital sources um, for um, you know, uh, queer founders and how, how we may think about allocating capital in that way. Amazing. Hi everyone, my name is Brian Luxinger. I'm the director of community at Gangels. We are an LGBTQI plus and diversity focused investment syndicate. We are currently one of the most active private investors in North America. Uh, we are a community strong of 3,000 investors and 1,700 portfolio companies. 1,000 of those investors are LGBTQIA+, and we have invested in over 300 LGBTQIA+, founders. Um, we are always focused on DE&I uh, across the globe, so super excited to talk today and potentially meet some of you founders after this. Hi, uh, I'm Kaylin Mendoza. Um, I am the CTO and co-founder of Clue. Clue is a skills-first hiring platform, uh, and we break down arbitrary barriers to entry um, uh, to democratize opportunity is the best way to describe it. Um, so we will help job seekers to articulate what it is that they can do in the form of skills, and then match them up to companies um, who are looking specifically for those skills. We're currently raising to accelerate our growth plans, and we're already revenue generating, and we launched in February. Hi everyone, my name is Alexi Boyajan. I'm one of the co-founders of Lavender Health. And what Lavender Health is, is a platform aiming to reduce 
inequalities um, in the healthcare space faced by LGBTQ individuals. We are currently a sexual health platform that connects queer individuals with queer specialized clinicians. And as of this week, actually, it's really exciting. We are the very first free remote UK prep service. So www.lavender.com <laughs> sign up. Uh, <laughs> um, our team is currently at 16 people. We have fundraised back in September 2021 1.5 million um, from, um, sorry, Octopus Ventures. And um, yeah, aiming to really support our community in the best way that we can. Great. Hi, uh, lovely to be here. I'm Mandeep Saw, and I'm one of the co founders of Bendy. We are a software company and we help large organizations with complex supply chains to understand the risks um, in that supply chain, predominantly around human rights abuses and environmental risks. Um, so, yeah, we use uh, deep techno technology to really forecast where those risks might lie and then how companies can allocate their resources to try and uh, reduce the likelihood of those types of risks. Uh, we're predominantly working in the textile and apparel sector, so mostly clothing at the moment. Uh, we're relatively early stage, um, and we've raised one small uh, friends and family round so far. Great, thank you. Um, and to finish off, I'm Barry. Um, I'm an independent management consultant. I work mostly in media. Uh, most of my time is spent at the Financial Times. If anyone's interested in that space, give me a shout later. Outside of that work, I'm also co-founder of a group called Series Q. Series Q is a group for LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs and creators. We're based in London, run regular events, and if you're interested in this space, please sign up at seriesq.com. So, let's kick off and talk about the challenges of raising funding when you're an LGBTQ plus founder. And Mandeep, how about we start with you? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think fundraising is incredibly hard, full stop. Um, and you said some stats at the beginning around queer founders. So firstly, I, th I think the data on queer fundraising is pretty incomplete. I've never been asked that specifically yeah. in an investor call. I've done over 100 pitches in the last you know, couple of years, I'd say. Um, and not once has someone asked me. Sometimes I've actively told them. But I think on top of that, there's a huge amount of intersectionality. So for myself, I'm a woman of color, I'm a woman and a queer woman of color. You put, you put all those things together and, and um, the odds are really heavily stacked against kind of being successful. So I think there's a, there's a lot in there. Um, and the challenges are just like, can, you be, can I be my authentic self in some of those calls, in some of that process? And I think some things I can't hide. You can tell I'm a woman. You can tell that I'm a woman of color. But the queerness, sometimes I have found myself basically try, trying to kind of lower it down in some way, like, like not being too aggressive. Um, I don't know. I, I think when asked a question, I've referred to my partner rather than my wife. And you're just concealing parts of yourself. And that, that of course, makes it even more challenging because Fundraising is about trust, it's about building connections, and so if you're not being your authentic self, it's really hard to ask someone to trust you if you don't really trust them. Mm. You mentioned um, very rarely have you been asked, are you LGBTQ? And you know how sometimes on job applications you get that diversity section. Have you ever come across any investor at all who has something like that diversity disclosure section? Um, yeah, actually one of the, uh, venture companies that invested us uh, last year, they, they didn't ask us after or anywhere in that process, but they did a um, survey. Mm -hmm. So they're called yeah. APX, they're based in Berlin, and they, I think they did one of the first surveys that we've seen come out of Europe. Um, but apart from that, no. Yeah, and if you don't collect the data, how do you ever know? Yeah. Um, Kevin, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I have lots of thoughts. Um, <laughs> uh, just to, to echo Mandeep, like raising and investing and starting a business, it's already hard enough as it is. And when you kind of layer um, uh, queer experience into that, I, I guess I've, I worked in places where I was asked to tone it down. Um, I have, um, I've been in environments where 
Uh, you have to kind of conceal yourself to not be bullied and ridiculed. And I guess if you imagine that you're stepping into a room to, to, to pitch your business and this is your whole future, and the people across the table are all there in suits hiding behind an identity that you just don't resonate with. And, and, and I guess the whole thing about that interaction is that you know, what it takes for you to actually build your company and the skills you need to do your job, that's not what's on display there. It's how you dress, it's how you speak, because you're doing everything to make them feel comfortable and what is actually making you feel comfortable. Mm. And so when you kind of layer that into the experience, it just makes it so much more harder than it needs to be, which is why I'm so excited about things like Series Q and Aries and Gangels and um, iCubed, who are creating a space where you can you know, just talk to people who are a little bit more like you, just to, to you know, every, every little bit helps. And actually, have you come across any challenges like this as well? Yeah, I can definitely echo a lot of the challenges that were ch shared by the panelists. And I think more predominantly, what I can say is that when we were fundraising, we're not only fundraising as queer founders, but we're also fundraising for a queer company. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. <laughs> it was it was really great and I think the biggest challenge that we faced was explaining the scope of the problem so when you're there you obviously are creating your deck and in your deck you have numbers numbers are arbitrary and they speak for themselves and no matter what number I'm gonna slap on that slide if you don't understand the scope of the problem it's not gonna mean anything to you so when I come to those investors and I tell them you know, 6% of the UK population is LGBT, and these are just numbers that we know about, because obviously queer identity is something extremely personal and difficult to, to know for sure. Um, and if I tell you that one in three Gen Z individuals identify as non-heteronormative, and this is a growing community whose needs are not being met, and then I tell you that there are 42 million people that identify as LGBT in Europe, and then I get an email. You know, we, we pitched to about 200 people because we were two co-founders <laughs> each pitching, 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 and then you get an email saying, you know, your idea is great, but the market's not big enough. And in my mind, I'm like, it's not the market that's not big enough. It's that you don't think that LGBT people need tailored sexual health care because you don't understand the scope of the problem, no matter how much I explain it to you. If I told you that there were 300,000 people with a chronic illness that needed the support of my company and, and you understood that problem, then I don't think we would be facing the same challenge. Um, but thankfully, you know, we had Gangel support us and give us our first check that really, you know, pushed us all the way to close our first funding round and we're eternally grateful to have that space, exactly as you said, right? And um, even with Octopus Ventures, the, the partner who is queer understood the scope of the problem and that's how we landed them. So it shouldn't be, the, it shouldn't be like a lottery and you shouldn't be you know, always going to queer investors to get that money for your company, you should be able to empathize with the problem. So as you said, the more scope and the more ability you have to fundraise for queer founders, the more you understand their needs and you humanize them and then they become less of just an enigma. Mm. So Brian, you invested in Lavender. We have indeed. Yeah, Did that, that problem, that lack of an understanding of the size of the queer community, is that something that you've seen again and again. We see it all the time. I think one of the things that's extremely difficult for people to come across is just seeing stories like themselves. I know queer founders are out there and often don't see other networks and a shameless plug, you'll see the Gangels 100 sitting around the room. Feel free to grab one. They are a spotlight of 100 LGBTQI plus venture backed founders. And one of the things we try to do as Gangels is bring these types of stories to life. And luckily Chris, who is Araxia's uh, co-founder, they will be in the feature this year. So yeah. we're super excited to see that. But um, going off your uh, comment earlier, Barry, actually Gangels was started by spinning off of Startout. So Startout was one of the initial groups of venture-backed founders really talking about how do LGBTQI plus <coughs> people bring their authentic selves to the table. And our founders were on the board of directors at Startout and they spun it off to say, well, we should talk about how should we get funding to these individuals? How do we start gathering that data and how do we create this space and this conversation that actually puts money behind all of these communities um, of people of diverse backgrounds? So although today we're not only investing in LGBTQI plus people, we see this same commonality of needing to see those different individual stories across all elements of diverse communities. So not only do we have a thousand LGBTQI plus investors in Gangels, we have over 850 people of color and 500 women. Having those numbers really, really helps accelerate Gangels because those people know what it's like to be the target market of some of these companies who identify as targeting people of diverse backgrounds. And 
really being able to create that connection and that authentic space for people to have these conversations um, has helped us come up with some new ideas and solutions that investors and founders all can bring to the table and we as angels are allowed to connect those people and help accelerate those solutions. Um, Gingers obviously isn't a social enterprise or a charitable enterprise rather. Um, it's you're making money. Mm -hmm. And what is it about the LGBTQ founder community that you think is a particularly attractive investment proposition? Why, why focus on them? Yeah, absolutely. So two of our, our two co-founders were LGBTQIA plus obviously and we have since expanded to eight partners in Gangels. and. I think we see so much grit in the LGBTQI plus community, and this is something that we like to bring up when we're talking about investment variables. Certain venture capital firms look at the schools you go to, they look at Stanford, they look at LBS, they look at Harvard, and they say, I know that person is so full of grit and full of determination because of that experience that they've had. But Gangels, we approach and we're like, we know that people who are LGBTQI plus, people of color, uh, gender diverse individuals, mm -hmm. all understand that they're also extremely resilient because they've been facing uphill battles their entire journey. And they've had to bring their authentic self to the table and understand how to navigate that journey. And if they've made it to the point where they're pitching to Gangels, we're working with Sequoia, we're working with Graycroft, all of those people are all sitting at the table. We want to be the person to help them really bring that story to life. So mm. yeah, we, we just we see the LGBTQI plus variable of founders similar to that of an education, similar to that of your prior work experience. It just it really does attest to how strong people are. And Daniel, so you've heard some stories from a bunch of LGBTQ founders there who've all found navigating their identity a challenge when fundraising. As someone who has been an investment professional for years, is that something that you've recognized? Um, abs absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a huge issue, and, I, and there's a whole ton of issues that have come up here which, which would take a lot of time to unpack. But, but I think, you know, taking a step back, one of the key things for the LGBTQI plus in this, uh, uh, classification of people is, is visibility, right? Um, and, and I think the more visibility we have and the more we feel comfortable, and, and I know prior panels have touched on authenticity, the more um, we feel comfortable being authentic and bringing our true selves to work, um, the more likely we are, uh, you know, gonna reach our potential. And I really like what Mandeep said earlier. I think, uh, you know, when it comes to business, it's, it's really about trust. It's about looking at the person on the other side of the table, connecting with them. And, and in order to do that, you really do need to bring your true self to the table, right? Um, and so how do we foster that? How do we create environments where people feel comfortable bringing their, their, their true identities to work um, so they can actually spend their energy focused on what they're trying to achieve? Um, and, and really the, the onus is on employers. So obviously I you know, sit, work for a very institutional organization. It's firms like us and, and people in our industry. Um, it's employers creating environments that are inclusive, um, where you know, welcoming, um, messaging and projecting um, a willingness to welcome all types of people in. Um, uh, you know, and, and I've had that experience, right, from the beginning. It took me many years to feel comfortable coming out to my colleagues, but there was a point when it happened, and, and actually it was a massive weight of my shoulders, and it allowed me to then really focus my energy on, on doing what I do best um, in the workplace. So I think the more we can create these types of environments where people can bring their um, true selves to work, the more this issue is going to go away, right, because the more we'll be able to build trust, the more we'll have people we can look up to, um, the more mentors we'll have. Um, so, I, you know, look, it's, it, it's going to be a long journey and, and a lot of progress has been made in the last five to ten years, I can tell you that, because when I started 15 years ago, it was definitely a different place. Um, but clearly a lot more work still to be done. Daniel, we've got this room which is full of people who want to set up businesses at some point in their career. If I can just paraphrase what you said, if you are out and open, you bring your true self to an investor conversation, do you think founders are more likely to be successful? Absolutely, because I think, um, and, and look, there are challenges. There's geographical challenges. There's parts of the world where there's a ton of capital, right, that's looking for a home, and you may not want to be particularly open about certain aspects of yourself. Um, so you do need to understand that and, and you know, read the situation. But I would say, at the end of the day, we're being, founders are being judged on the quality of their ideas and their ability to, to set up businesses and, and, and make them succeed not on their sexuality or, or identity. 
Um, so if you can bring your true self, then I think you've got a higher likelihood of, of succeeding at the end of the day. And maybe you're going to ask me later, but is there capital available specifically mm. for um, um, you know, ESG or the DEI within e ESG or the S? Right, the S part, like th there's a lot of different classifications, and the answer is yes, there's a ton of capital available, and there's, there's more and more capital available. The question is how do you how do you source it, and how do you put that capital with, um, you know, LGBTQ uh, plus founders? Do you know that that's a really nice segue into like the question of how do we bridge the gap? Because you know, there's in spite of all the positive words coming out of this group. The data is still there. You know, not 0.5% of investment funding goes towards LGBTQ identified founders. How do we bridge that gap? Do we just create some sort of a quota, perhaps? Kaylin, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think quotas are interesting because, like, particularly coming from a background where you have to work so hard just to see some value in yourself because everything kind of makes you feel like um, there's something wrong with you. Mm. It means that like when you are getting somewhere and you're, you're, you're doing well, the last thing that you want is for someone to give you an opportunity because you're queer or because mm. you're in a wheelchair. Like, you know, you, you want to kind of earn it, but meritocracy is not a thing. Like, you need to recognize that it's not a level playing field, it's not fair, and so actually, when it comes to bridging that gap, you can't do it just by working harder and being better than the people who are, you know, sort of beating you down. This is where you have to actually work with your community. We, we've seen how quickly groups can mobilize behind a movement, mm -hmm. and so you need to not see this as copping out or, or just getting help. This is actually how you sort of um, make, it, make yourself more visible. And the more that people see it, the more normalized it becomes. I think that you break it down from that visibility, not from kind of butting your head up against the wall. Yeah, Mandeep, would you agree? Visibility, that's part yeah. of the solution. Or are you I'm into quotas? <coughs> I'm into quotas, yeah. <laughs> yeah? I, think, um, I, I think if you have had structural kind of inequalities for a long time, um, you have to change the structure in order to um, equalize the playing field in, so, in some sort of way. And so you can't just be like, okay, it's, it's unequal, let's see how they do. But that doesn't, there has to be something that's pretty active. And quote is a way of doing that, um, allocating some sort of resource, maybe even some specific amount in a fund, or even mm -hmm. having some targets, some KPIs. I mean, I think I've spoken to a few funds or heard them speak, but that, you know, more and more funds that I, speaking to, are, they are setting goals around ESG for their own funds themselves. Um, so that might be things around sexuality mm -hmm. or um, race or gender. So e even the fact that everyone is now looking at that, I think is a great thing. It doesn't have to be a hard quota, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, active structural change requires mm -hmm. work. Fran, you said something earlier um, about I think you said, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that not all founders you invest in are LGBTQ+. Mm -hmm. well, can you talk us through? Yeah, absolutely. So back in 2018 was when we actually structured ourselves as an investment syndicate. So before mm. that, it was just an informal angel group um, who got together and basically made investment decisions. Back in 2018, we restructured as an LGBTQI plus investment syndicate only looking to invest in the LGBTQI plus space. See, we saw a massive... Um, Massive success in that first year, deploying about five million in capital. And we realized the following year that as we were accelerating that growth, that we had a privilege there. There was a lot of white men still in the room. And although they were queer, they still were getting access to those opportunities because the people sitting at, at the other end of the table still could identify with them at some point. Mm. So at that point, we made the decision, our mission is social change through business. And we decided that, that we were gonna open it up to um, diverse founders of all communities. And we took that to the next step. And then that following year, we deployed uh, 20 million. Uh, continued that ethos then for the following year in 2019, and we accelerated up to 100 million in uh, capital deployed, bringing us to the element of, if we are continuing this accelerated growth, how are we gonna keep generating that social change through business? Um, and then this is actually one of the controversial points at Gangels, is we actually decided we're going to invest in people who are also not diverse, but who are really committed to diversity and want to understand how to better improve their business, better, offer, or better supply opportunities to people who are of diverse backgrounds, even if they themselves are not. So 
under that ethos, then we brought even more people behind us, and that kind of catapulted us into the next reign. Currently sitting with 700 million under management, and we see, just like you said, under quotas. We don't actually have a quota, but 25% of our investments have been made into female founders, 30% uh, are queer, and about 35% are people of color. So we're working on bringing those up, and that is kind of where we're focused right now. Um, but we also want to acknowledge the fact that if you were to look at the Gangels team, a straight white man is diverse at Gangels. We don't have many of them on our team, and that <laughs> shocks a lot of people. But based on how we were started by a bunch of gay guys who were just investing in companies, it makes sense. So we ourselves are always working at that element of what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean, mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that, breaking it down to its simplest terms, everybody gets an oppor or equal and opportunist a um, access to this capital. And saying, if you were to put pizza on a table, that everybody can have a slice, regardless of who you are sitting at that table. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Araxi, how, how about yourself? Do you, do you think of any, um, are there any ways we can bridge the gap that you've noticed? I think it's a twofold answer. I definitely think that quotas are really important because as we said earlier, if investors had two or three or four you know, um, queer founders on, in their portfolio, then they can empathize with the situation, understand it better, and start to develop change at scale. However, I think this might be also negative in the sense that to the same point that you were making, you don't want to just be that like token company on someone's portfolio. It's like, my God, LGBT, love them. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you don't, you don't want to be that person. It's like, she's a lesbian. <laughs> um, we gave her money. But at the same time, it's like, then if you become that tokenistic company and you don't do well, then you don't want to be that example that becomes set as like, oh, we invested in LGBT, they, they don't do well. Like, we're not going to keep on doing that either. So it's like a, like a two-edged sword. It's like you really need to be choosing people on merit. Um, but also fill those quotas depending on the merit of these individuals. So it's like both mm -hmm. need to play an, impor an important part. And then the last thing I would say is that inclusion and exclusion is an interesting part of what we do because at Lavender, right, where it's like LGBTQ plus sexual health. And then, they, and then we've actually had um, some of our partners in the, uh, at the NHS say, isn't that exclusionary? I'm like, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're trying to do is bridge the gap. So by directly addressing the need, then you can open it up to allies and then they can also use a service. It's like expanding and broadening the, the offering at the end of the day and, and picking the right people. Great. Um, let's talk about opportunities. And Danny, you mentioned earlier that there are pools of capital out there that are accessible specifically with a social impact lens or a diversity lens. Maybe could you talk us through what they are and how potentially any of the prospective founders in this room could access them? Sure, uh, so it, it's mostly coming from the end investor side, right? So super institutional capital, pension fund capital, predominantly coming from European um, countries, you know, but, but also increasingly from Canada and the US, um, w which is specifically earmarked for, you know, impact. And uh, there's all sorts of different definitions. There's impact, there's, there's you know, DEI, there's, there's ESG, capital, so, so part of it is they will invest with managers who are going to allocate capital to you know, founders, um, and they, will, they may have requirements, or they may, have, um, they, they may just want to have an understanding that the underlying, um, you know, where that capital is going, is going to um, you know, meet, those, meet, meet certain quotas, or at least slates, right? Um, some of it is just because it's the right thing to do, um, and, and these pension funds, um, I guess feel pressure from you know, wh whoever invests in those pension funds, so the individuals, that they need to be doing this. Um, but there's also um, increasingly, uh, you know, some of it is, is regulatory-led. So th there are regulatory um, situations. Uh, I'm not gonna get into te technical details, but there's a regulation in Europe called SFDR, um, and they, they give article classifications to to funds, and, and so an Article 6 fund is a standard fund that just does what it does, right? An Article 8 fund um, incorporates ESG into its investment activities. An Article 8 plus or a nine, an Article 9 fund um, is, is really an impact fund um, which seeks to generate some sort of positive change, right? Oftentimes, 
um, you know, in real assets, that's going to relate to things like environmental, you know, in, uh, you know, positive change for the climate, right? Um, but they, they, it could be the S. Um, and, uh, you know, that, there was a lot of capital that is looking for Article 9 opportunities, and those opportunities aren't really there. Um, but this kind of goes back to, you know, the beginning of the discussion, which is if we don't have the data and we don't know whether the founders are LGBTQ+, then how are we going to know, right? So, so I think um, one of the, the key things here is data collection and understanding, you know, um, who it is that you're investing in. Um, because that will then start to solve some of these issues, but, but the, the, there is certainly willingness of, you know, with the end investor to direct capital in this direction. Excellent. Um, does anyone else have some thoughts on where opportunities could lie? I'll expand upon that a little bit because we are actively working at Gangels to better gather that type of data, and we actually are planning on doing it with all of our portfolio companies and understanding exactly how do those demographic makeups work. Um, I actually had a conversation, I just went down to Paris to speak with one of our portfolio unicorns called Equanto, um, and in, they were telling me that they don't feel comfortable gathering that data. And that is what I think is so difficult for us, is although we want to expand DEI, we approach it very much from an American perspective and have to understand that someone in the French culture doesn't, isn't going to approach it the same way we are. So one of the things we've actually done with one of our funds, and although it's incorporated in the state, so it doesn't have the number classification, is we have um, a diversity fund, which is a later stage fund, meaning we invest in series B and onward, um, but we actually take 2.5% of the fund as a fee, and then we take about 50% of that and put it into thought leaders in the industry. So we actually pull in diversity, equity, and inclusion experts. We pull in people focused on diversity and recruiting, and we bring them into the venture capital space and say, how can we do this better? We know we're not the first people talking about DE and I. It's been a discussion for years and years, and there are some people who are doing it and doing it well. How do we fund them and make sure their thought leadership is being put into venture capital, is being put up, put into the startup community, mm -hmm. and see how can we make this whole landscape better? And we've actually taken the choice to use that 1.5 or 1.25 percent of the total fund to allocate towards that. And not only is that beneficial to our mission of social change through business, but it also attracts really big impact investors who are like, I believe that they are gonna do this and do this well now, and that's why I wanna put my money behind Gangel. So I think there's definitely a next step a lot of people can take with this, and we're only in the beginning of understanding how we can actually finance these funds to do so. That's great. Um, on that note, does anyone in the audience have any questions um, for anyone on the panel? Pop your hand up if, if you do. It's been a long day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a lengthy question, and a bit to unpack. Um, it's more for the uh, question for the investors. Um, so it's it's great that there is so much investment going into the LGBTQ plus community from actually LGBTQ plus investors. Mm -hmm. However, if you were to meet other investors, because obviously as we've been discussing, it should be based on merit. If you were to meet other investors, what information would you share with them to kind of change their perception on investing into LGBTQ plus companies or products or services? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's so much data out there, but I think the biggest one is that the LGBTQI plus community is just such a massive impact and only growing everywhere. One of the stats that was actually brought to me, so I'm new to the United Kingdom. I only moved here in September of last year, but somebody actually told me that the percentage of population, I believe, Araxia, you told me, is 8% here, yeah. and that's actually larger than Wales. And there's more <laughs> LGBTQI plus people than Welsh people in the United Kingdom, and that actually puts things into perspective. And I think what we're trying to do right now is reframe the data that we do have um, and make it resonate with investors more. So although what I would use in the States is, the global um, GDP of what is projected to be LGBTQI plus is somewhere between 3.2 and 3.6 trillion dollars. I wouldn't use that same stat over here because I want it to resonate on a more localized basis. And that is looking at something that's much more global. So I think there's tons of opportunities, but as you speak to investors, you need to understand what are they looking for and what is the product that you can most closely identify that data with to make it resonate with them. So. I know that's kind of a roundabout answer to say so, but um, it's definitely something you have to take on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Anyone else? There's from. Uh, I think a lot of people put their hand up when they said they want to start a business at some point in their career. I guess more, my question is some of you are co-founders, some of you I see work with a lot of co-founders. What would be your advice uh, for making the jump over to starting your business or preparing to make the jump? Would have possible. I mean, I think we probably all can add something, but if I could quickly add something like, um, when uh, I guess you're trying to find the energy and the determination to do something which is just so difficult and insurmountable, it needs to be something that you believe in um, because like no one's gonna get you out of bed to make you do it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that it has to really mean something to you. What um, I would add is I agree. Um, but then you get someone who gets you out of bed, and that's the co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have no words for, um, for my co-founder, Chris. They, they really are, yeah, my backbone, um, and, and I theirs, hopefully. If they were here, they should say the same thing. Um, but uh, definitely finding the right partner that believes in the same mission and co-aligning, it's so difficult. Like, genuinely, there are days you don't want to get out of bed, and there are days you're like, why am I even doing this? Um, or how did I get here? And, and then it's fun because then it's my turn and then two weeks later it's their turn and then we you know, support each other. So it's finding the right partner to get you through it all. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. So I think uh, what's been interesting is it's the wins are like, they, they feel really, really good and you can kind of just like, I think having someone to share them with, because the downs, you're just like, okay, right, I'm not gonna let this get on top of me. I'm just gonna pull myself yeah. off the floor and keep yeah. going, but I think having someone who's been through all of the ups and downs, sharing that wins, it's amazing. So I definitely yeah. agree with that. Having a co-founder, I, I, I think it's like 10 times harder to do it by yourself. Yeah. Um, so chapeau to you, I think, for sure. Um, I wouldn't say it was a leap or a jump in any way. It was more of a, it, there were a million small steps and at one point, you know, you just like start a website and then you put a few things That's up and then you like make a little deck and you send it to someone that you know and then, and then they're like, oh, that sounds good. And you get yeah, obsessed. You, then, then you start getting <laughs> obsessed. And you, I you know, had a full-time job and I was spending every waking minute. Like then lockdown happened and I did nothing else apart from like work on my business. And I remember my co-founder and I, we would spend like 10 hours on the phone <laughs> um, during lockdown, just like, I don't know what we talked about, <laughs> but it was that, you, once you're like so mad about this idea, um, it just grows into yeah. something, and next thing you know, you've registered a company, and off you go. Yeah. <laughs> just very quickly, to each of you, where did you find your co-founders? Grinder. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I actually grew up with my co-founder, so we, we both grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, so we were neighbors, and uh, when we were 13 or 12, we um, founded like mini businesses, like uh, purses and clothes for dogs, and it, it, it was meant to be. It was going to happen eventually, so yeah, yeah. It, it was a long time coming. How about you, Mandy? How did you know this story? Um, I met Ben um, at university, at LGBT, so yeah. yeah, and then we didn't, like, we did completely different things. Uh, and then I did a accelerator. It was like a part-time accelerator about like taking some sort of idea to market. And there was like no commitment, it was one day a week. And I had this like idea and I showed it to Ben and he was like, oh my God, that's really boring. You don't want to do <laughs> yeah. that. Um, uh, it was some sort of like app to make meetings more efficient. He was like, that's a waste of your life, don't do that. Um, and he happened to be working in sustainability for like a really large brand and it was like oh actually there are some really big issues in this there's like impact and I feel excited about this and uh, and so yeah just got him involved <laughs> excellent how about yourself um so my co-founder is actually my boyfriend um which is which is fun, <laughs> no, uh, which is fun. <laughs> yeah. no and the thing is that like um he was he was working pre with another uh, co-founder who it, it it wasn't um the right relationship and so he then ended up on his own and he's building this product with these um, software developers who were just didn't really know what they were doing. And so it reached a point of that product is terrible. Okay, fine, I will make it for you. And I, I joined the business to kind of fix the product. Yeah. And actually the thing is that what I can do um, sits in areas that he is not comfortable in and what he can do sits 
squarely in the areas that I'm not comfortable in. So it's kind of like, why wouldn't we? It was, it was like, um, you know, you can't beat the whole pizza. You need to be, you, but you need to know what slices you are. Just check your mm -hmm. boyfriend's first, then co-founders. Or co-founders yes, then, yeah. Yes, boyfriend's okay. first, <laughs> then co-founders. <laughs> and uh, it's probably something we don't m mention in our investor conversations, uh, just from what we were discussing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, any other questions? There's one at the back, at the very back. Hi, Bear. Is that working? Yeah. Um, hi, Barry and panelists. First, I want to thank you for a very interesting and informative and entertaining uh, panel <laughs> discussion. Um, I love this idea of creating more space for queer and other diverse uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I love the idea of having queer people on the investment side as well. Um, but I just want to scratch at that kind of rosy image for a minute because investing in these types of businesses and investing in these types of funds come along with all sorts of minimums, which actually make it a little bit exclusive. And although there's this myth of the pink pound and this idea that queer people are, especially gay men, make so much money and they've got so much disposable income, um, actually for a lot of queer people, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like you to do, um, and this is maybe a little bit unfair, because I'm asking you to think on the spot, um, if you were to envision what we could do to take this ecosystem to make it more accessible by all queer people so that by investing in each other we can raise our entire community, what would you do? So you're not making me think on the spot. I think about this every day. Um, if, yes, I, I'm not even gonna get on my high horse about how much I do not agree with the accreditation policies and taking down accredited investor. If I leave one legacy in this world, it will be to knock all of the accreditation rules off of the platform. So for everyone in the room who's not familiar, venture capital is one of the riskiest asset classes. You can invest money into a company and lose it all in one day when the market downturns. So there's financial regulation put in place so that people have to have a certain threshold of liquidity, a certain threshold of assets that they own before they can actually get access to this um, asset class. But this asset class is also generational wealth building. It is incredible, and it creates an exclusive community because of this financial regulation. Um, I will say that I personally, so I've only been here for a year, and one of my first things I did was actually go and speak with individuals in the government here who, have, who control this, the Minister of Investments, and start having that conversation about what are these barriers to entry and why does this exist? So in the United States, we do still have to have accredited investors. So somebody who's made $200,000 over the past three years, um, or they can qualify under 14 other terms. But when you come over here, it's a little bit higher. So in the States, we actually run um, single asset LLCs, which allow for our investors to actually make those investment decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. So although they can participate in our funds, which we have an early stage with a minimum of a $25,000 investment, or the later stage with a minimum of a $100,000 investment, we actually do single asset LLCs, which allows people to actually come in at $1,000 or $500 with no investment minimum so that we can actually start democratizing this asset class and giving it back to the people. It is a lot of legal work. It is so much diligence that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis to provide this type of access, but it is always at the front of our mind because we cannot democratize this unless we actually change the financial regulation and the structures that have been put in place for so long to keep people like us out of it but there are so many amazing people who are willing to get behind this ideology now. So I will say that I, I personally am actively working at it on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think the investment community definitely has it at the top of mind, but all you can do is really work with government officials and constantly explain to them that if someone can put $1,000 into the crypto market on a crypto exchange like FTX and lose it all in one day, why can't they do the same with venture capital? So. I'm continuously fighting that to showcase that venture capital isn't nearly as risky as the perception is, but it's a constant conversation because you can totally see it from their side too. They don't want you to lose your money. They don't want people who are not educated in this space to all of a sudden be able to throw their money at this stuff. So it's all an educational, it's all around education and it's all around regulation, but I think about this every day, so I hear you. I, I would just, I mean, I think that's all spot on. I would just add that, um, you know, the big alternative asset managers um, are seeing this trend of democratization of access to private assets, mm -hmm. right? And this is definitely happening across the board. The trend is going that way. So I have to imagine that in time, it'll do the same for, mm -hmm. for VC. So there's a lot of 
focus. I mean, all of us asset manager, managers want to raise as much capital as we possibly can. So we love going to retail markets, right? And, and you know, investors who've got smaller ticket sizes. And so, as you rightly say, it's just a matter of regulation changing. And, and you know, Europe is far more complicated than the US given the multi multitude of different you know, regulatory systems. Um, but the hope is that we'll, we'll get there at some point. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I think we probably have time for one more question, perhaps. Yeah, we have a question from Zoom. Um, this is coming from Chris Rojo. He's a LGBTQ ally who used to work in venture capital back in the Philippines. He has a good story. He, he's proud to share that his most successful portfolio company was coming from someone who with a queer background. Um, so that's good. Question is, how can people like allies approach the conversation, or venture capitalists to approach a conversation with LGBTQ founders? Um, it seems that there's two approach. One is to make that conversation very standardized, um, so there's no treat LGBTQ people differently, or tailor fit that investment conversation to make it a little more um, LGBTQ friendly and make LGBTQ people more shine better. Um, I know we touched on this a little bit, but um, to see if you have any additional perspectives. <coughs> One of the founders? Oh, I, I mean, um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll share a thought that I'm having in real time. Um, I literally saw the thought. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it downloaded. just came in from the, the rainbow colored lights in the corner. Um, and I guess um, the parallel that I think of is, you know, when people are trying to hi hire in an inclusive way, they will say, cool, let's do name blind CVs. And the thing is that that's kind of hiding the problem. It's not really doing anything about the fact that, you know, well, the, the inherent bias. Um, and so the idea of sort of trying to standardize it and take the, the queer out, I'm not necessarily a fan of because I mm -hmm. think that that's putting all the onus on the individual as opposed to the institution. And so the challenge is more how you can um, make the institution create a safe space mm -hmm. rather than relying on the individual to feel comfortable enough to bring themselves. Um, how you do that, I think it's very challenging, mm -hmm. but I think that that's the, that's the way you need to approach it. You need to think about what you can do to make people comfortable. Mm. I, I totally, oh, do you want to go, Xia? Yeah. Do you want to go first? Um, I was just going to echo what you were saying, like standardization might not be the way, however opening instances of transparency could be helpful and, and, and letting individuals know this is a safe space, but I wouldn't want to feel like that this treatment is differentiated. I would rather them, you know, explicitly ask a question if they're not sure or in order to give me the capacity or the scope to support and help them understand something that they're not too sure about. But it is also on them to do a bit more research into the community as well and have a standard, at least basic level of understanding of queer needs. Just the bare minimum, like if you go up to someone and you talk to them about HIV and they don't know what that is, that's like, it's been around for a while, you should know. Um, so that's, that's what I think. Great. Any final thoughts? I think creating the safe spaces there is huge. So we do about 200 events a year at Gangels, about 80 of those in person. And actually, we preface every single event with bring your authentic self and have that conversation around DE and I. I can't tell you the amount of straight white men who have shown up and said, my daughter is trans or my son is gay. And they want to be there for the community and they don't know how. We create those safe spaces for them to come in and ask those questions. They come, they meet LGBTQI plus VC partners, they meet queer founders, they meet queer investors, and they're open and honest and they know they can come into those spaces and ask how can I best support your community and not be blindsided by anyone showing up and saying, well, you're not part of the community. So I, it's all around creating those safe spaces and not being exclusionary, about bringing everybody together. And back to the accreditation thing, we have something called the social membership in Gangels for people who aren't quite at that accreditation level so that they can still get access to these spaces. They can still learn from everybody from an education perspective. They can show up in person and network until they get to that accredited, or accredited level. And that's something we've seen be so powerful in bringing people of diverse backgrounds into this space and be able to tell their authentic stories. Great. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for listening. And everyone who put their hands up earlier saying they were going to start a business, I hope you do it. Me too. Yeah. And tell me about it. You've got it. the investors. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all of us will be around, so like please feel free to give us a Okay. Just a selfish um, ask, because um, 
this panel was an idea that this team created, so Aww. we just wanted to take a quick photo with the panelists here. Seeing this come to life is, is, was very interesting. And we had like hours of debate on how we structure this conversation, so. And you see this is one of the biggest panels too, is we have five panels. I love it. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic, of course. Yeah. yeah.